Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Thanks for joining us for this session on our Sunday morning. I hope you guys have woken up. You are not still sleepy. So in today's session, I am going to cover a little bit about the importance of these exams and what else should you be doing to improve your chances of admission. You keep hearing this word a lot, profile. You know, you must have a good profile or your profile is not good enough. What does this profile mean? What is a good profile? So I hope by the end of this session, you will have a few action items, that uh, things that you can do to improve your profile. All right. Uh, some of you are not Jambori students. So quickly for you guys, a uh, little bit about Jambori. So we have been doing this since 1993. That is 30 years old. So it's like we are older than a lot of you here. One of our flexes is that, you know, more than 25% of, of our students score 1,400 or more, more on the SAT. In fact, about a tenth, about uh, uh, 12, 15, 12 to 15% of our students score 1,500 or more on the SAT. We produce the, we have produced the highest number of 1,500 plus SAT scores. And we also get quite a lot of our students who get admitted to the top universities. So for fall 2024, the admission decisions, you know, the people who had applied in the November 1 deadlines, so their uh, admission decisions have started coming out. We already have three top admits. Three of our students have gotten into Ivy Leagues. We had one student who have gotten into uh, Cornell, one into Dartmouth, and one into Columbia. So this is just from the students who have applied in the November 1 deadlines. The regular decision deadlines, the, the January deadlines are the applications as, uh, process is still going on. And it's not just once, you know, this year. Last year, we had students who had gotten into Harvard, Brown, year before that also. So every year, we get students who get into the Ivy Leagues, the really top universities in the world. Now, uh, all of you are preparing for the SAT or taking the SAT or have taken the SAT because you want to get admission. The goal is not to get a high SAT score. Right? That is not the end goal. The end goal is to get admission to a good college. Am I right? Do you agree? Yes. You know, when you are preparing for your SAT, you should try to get as high a score as possible. But that is not the end game. The end goal is to get admission to a college of your choice. So do not lose sight of the things that matter. What are the admissions criteria? SAT is just one of the components, not all that, all not the entire component. So when you apply to universities, you will need these things. Without these things, you know, the admissions criteria, you cannot, you will not be considered for admission. First, you will need a standardized test. If you're applying to uh, applying to the US, then some of the colleges will need the SAT, will require the SAT. If you're not applying to the US, if you're applying to uh, Canada, UK, Australia, New Zealand, you know, any other country, then you would need a language test either the TOEFL or the IELTS, if you are an Indian passport holder. So if you are an Indian passport holder, you will need a language test in any country, in any English-speaking country that you apply to, right? Um, however, if you are applying to US, then you may need the SAT plus the language test. So when I say standardized test, it may depending on the country that you are applying to, it can mean anything. It can mean the either of these two, the language test or the SAT. Then your academic record, Academic record means class 9th, 10th, 11th, and your 12th predicted grades and midterm grades. Right? So that is the meaning of academic records. So universities, they look at your marks right from class 9th. It's not that they are going to look at only your 11th or only your 10th. So in India, we have this thing that students score very high in the, uh, in the board exams. So our students, they score a pretty high marks in class 10, but unfortunately, a lot of them are not able to sustain those high percentages in class 11. So that is not a good thing. So in case you are in class 10 right now, you know, so make sure that you do well in your class 10 exams, yes, but equally important, do not let your marks drop drastically in class 11. So the difference between your class 10th and class 11th should not be more than you know, 5, 10 percentage. If by chance your class 11th marks are higher than your class 10th, then you have got a huge advantage. Very less percentage of Indian students you know, have this thing. So if your class 11th marks are higher than your class 10th, then you are already in the minority, right? Which is good. You know, getting admission means 
being the best from the applicant pool. So if you are, if you have something that is better than the rest, that means your chances of getting admission increases, right? In case your class 11 marks are not so good, some of you may be already in class 12, right? Or you are already halfway through your class 11. So if you feel that your class 11 marks are not going to be as good as your class 10 marks or better than your class 10 marks, then by hook or by crook, you know, you have to do well in your class 12. The predicted grades that your school will submit, you know, to the university as your predicted grades, that those grades then will have to be at a class 10th level, okay, or better. So make sure that you do not take your eye off your academic record. Okay. This becomes especially important if you are applying to countries where SAT is not required. So if you want to, if you're applying to UK or Canada or Australia, New Zealand, where uh, where or Ireland, you know, where SAT is not required, then in the, you know, for academics, you, you have to rely completely on your school grades. If you're applying to countries such as US, you know, then even if your academics are not that good, you can hope to compensate for that with a, with a, in a good SAT score. The next thing that you need, you know, application or application essays. Is there anybody who has uh, started the application process? Anybody who has already submitted the applications in the first round, the early November deadlines? Anyone who has already submitted a few applications? If you have, then you can type yes in the chat. If you haven't started your applications, then please type no in the chat so that I know, you know, what to, uh, what to talk about. I repeat, if you have started your applications right, yes. If not, then type no. Okay, so all of you, have, majority of you have not started your applications. So first step is that if you are applying to UK, there is this platform called UCAS, U-C-A-S. Go and make your account there. It's a, making the account is free. Submitting the application costs money, but making the account is free. If you are applying to US, then go and make your account in Common App. C O M M O N A P P common app dot org. Go and make your account there, right? That you will know the application process. It's a pretty lengthy process, by the way. And there are a lot of application essays that you have to write. Okay, so the application essays is uh, you cannot submit your university applications unless you have the application essays. Then the letters of recommendation. If you're applying to UK, Canada, etc., you will need one letter of recommendation, but majority of the U.S. universities will need three letters of recommendation. So the, these letters of recommendation will have to come from your school counselor and your teachers. Okay, so the this is also a process that you should start now, especially if you are targeting the January deadlines. The In the U.S., a lot of the universities have their deadlines in January. Your school will probably be closed for New Year, New Year and Christmas. So anything that you need from the school should be done now. Uh, you, if the school is closed, then you may not have the opportunity to get the letters of recommendation and the academics, etc., before you know before the deadline. So if you are if you are applying for fall twenty twenty four, that means if you are applying for next year, the session starting next year, and if you haven't started your applications yet, I recommend you to start ASAP. A lot of schools are going into their winter break, and during that time, it will be difficult for you to get hold of your teachers, right? If you have not, if you are, if you are like targeting uh, sessions that are starting in 2025, etc., that's good. Just still write it down somewhere, mark your calendar that uh, as far as possible, apply in the November deadlines. If you're applying in the January deadlines, then everything related to the school should be done by middle of December or at least before the Christmas break starts. In some of the very top universities, a handful of the very top universities also have an interview round. So in Oxford, uh, Cambridge, uh, uh, UC Berkeley, UCLA, UPenn, MIT, some of these really, really top universities, they have an interview route. These interviews uh, can be like video interviews or they can be one-on-one -on -one interviews with their alumni. You know, it, that's if you are from Bangalore and you get an interview call from UPenn, let's say, then if they have a, have an alumnus you know, who is living in Bangalore, then they would prefer that that person meets you in person. However, if that is not possible, then they will go for a video interview. But be mindful that if you are targeting the Ivy Leagues, the very top-notch universities, there will be an interview round as well. 
So these basically are the application criteria. What that means is that if you do not have these, then you will not be considered for admission, right? Now my question is, if you have these, let's say you have the SAT score, you have all of these, you have your essays, letters, everything you have, okay, you have submitted the application. So you are going to be considered for admission. Does that mean that you will get admission? Meeting these admissions criteria, does that mean that you will get admission? What do you think? Yes or no? If you meet these admissions criteria, does it guarantee that you will be, get admission? Okay, good. All of you have answered correctly. It does not mean that you will get admission. It just means that you are now not going to be directly rejected. You will be considered for admission. Considered for admission is does not mean guaranteed admission. The top universities, even any like uh, like any top university across the world, it can be a uni top university in Singapore like NUS or a top university in Canada like University of Toronto. All these universities, their acceptance rates are lower than 10%. The Ivy League colleges, you know, uh, their acceptance rates are lower than 5%. That means out of every 100 students who were considered for admission, 95 were rejected or 90 were rejected. So just meeting the admissions criteria, just fulfilling the application requirements is not good enough. You now have to change the way you think the application process. You have to now think in terms of what do universities want? They are going to, uh, they are making you write essays, submit letters of recommendation, your academics, your SAT, what are they looking for? What On what parameters are they going to evaluate your application file? Whatever you are seeing on the screen, this is your application file, right? Now, when, the, when an admissions committee member is going through your application file, what is he or she looking for? So think on those terms. Some of you who are in class 10th and 11th or even class 9th, please pay attention. Because now you, this is this is what you should be reverse engineering, right? Once you know what the universities are looking for, you can then specifically work towards those points. Those of you who are in class 12 and who will be applying for the 2024 session, you do not have too much time to move around things. But now when you are writing your applications, you have to write them in such a manner, the application essays, etc., you have to write them in such a manner that you present your best foot forward in a, man, in a manner that you are meeting the university's assessment criteria. So in your applications, those of you who are targeting 2024, in your applications, make, make sure that you check these boxes, that all these things have to be covered. Those of you who, are, who have a couple of years in hand or even a one year in your hand, then please uh, like work on your profile in such a manner that you end up with these points. The first thing is that universities want students who are good, uh, period, right? Especially if you're an international student. They don't want you to go and then flunk exams there, right? As an international student, if your GPA falls below two out of four, your, your student visa gets revoked. Right. So if you if you go to any any country, you know, there is a minimum academic standard you have to maintain. Getting admission is just the first step. You have to maintain the bare minimum academic uh, cutoffs required by the universities for you to maintain your visa status. Therefore, the students want good students. So they do not want the risk of losing students. You know, midway through the first year or second year. Now to assess academic excellence, what do they look at? Your SAT score comes into the picture for universities which need the SAT score, obviously. Your school grades, you know, they are important. That's why they are important. Uh, universities get an idea about whether you will be able to cope with their curriculum or not, depending on the grades that you have scored all four years. There may be in one year you may have done badly. Fine. That is why they look at all four years. They want to give you the benefit of doubt, right? If you have messed up your class 10, or that's, that's fine. You know, if you have now doing better in class 11 and 12, so they are going to give you benefit of doubt for that. So in academics, anything else, if you have done um, some Olympiads, if you have participated in some Olympiads, if you have taken some additional courses, online courses or university courses, 
or um, you know summer school anything where you have studied taken exams and gotten grades so that would come under academic excellence however maximum weight is, is given to your school grades doesn't matter which country you are applying to your your a lot of weightage is going to be given to your school grades depth of course interest so that means whatever program you are applying for how genuinely do you want to go do that program what have you done to explore your interest so if you're applying for computer science are you applying for computer science just because you know you think it is fancy or are you applying for computer science just because your father is a computer engineer or because your uh, relatives are computer engineers right? so they they don't want that they want to make sure that you have explored it enough that you have the aptitude to do good in that field whether it is computer science mechanical engineering economics psychology whatever program you are applying for you have to do something in addition to your coursework so in class 11th and 12th you take a lot of students take common subjects maths physics chemistry or maths english psychology you know you have these common subjects so based on those subjects how can you decide that you want to apply for this program if you are doing let's say uh, commerce you are in the commerce stream right and you have um, you have uh, business studies or accounting maths etc based on that how do you know that you want to go for marketing for instance right so whatever field you are applying for whatever program you are going to apply for you must do something additional to prove that you have explored it beyond your coursework this is very important doesn't matter which you know which country you apply to the first two points these two points are mandatory everywhere this can be the make or break of your profile you know? so uh, for instance you know last year we had a, a student who got into harvard right so he his sat score was not that good however he had he was applying for something you know astrophysics he had done so much you know research he had done uh, so many projects international conferences etc related to astrophysics so he has he had really dived deep into his course of interest right so whatever program you are applying for you have to have some things you know to prove that you have explored it enough it can be some coursera courses some edx courses it can be some projects that you have done outside your coursework not the not in your school outside anything so this is a very important part um those of you who have a year or so you know before you apply make sure that you invest enough time in this these two points are mandatory like anywhere that you apply to now as you go as you go higher and higher in the rankings the universities become more and more selective then their requirements also change they become even more like uh, restrictive so to say they want they become more selective they want to see more and more in students profiles so the next three points you should work on these three points if you want to target top 50 university in the world so i repeat if you want to target the top 50 universities in the world then you have to work on all these five points if you are okay with just is you not know, getting into a good university but not a top 50 university then it's okay if you just stick to the first two points right it's all about what kind of college you aspire to get into so in case you want to get into a top 50 college in the 15 you know, college in the world then you have to like demonstrate activities that relate to creativity you know so you have to be able to demonstrate that how do you demonstrate that social media is a good place so if you let's say um uh, your hobby is singing or your hobby is painting then have something related to that post on your instagram handle or you can have a blog also a lot of you are not on social media which is good so you can have a blog you know and you can post videos there you can uh, post your you know, take pictures of your paintings or whatever there if you play sports then uh, let's say you have been uh, playing tennis you know since the age of 9 or 10 then i'm sure there will be pictures of you so put all those pictures up you know to establish the history it should not come across as if you are doing it you know for the sake of you know for the sake of application so all of that you know you should take care of the next point is leadership 
universities, especially the Ivy League universities, they love students who have demonstrated leadership during their school life, right? So if you are in the student council of your school, or you are the head boy or the head girl or um, head of the MUN or something, some response, some position of responsibility awarded to you by the school. That is, that is a clincher. That is like, uh, that helps a lot. If not, then anything else. Maybe the school has some clubs that you are a member of that you are leading, or maybe some extracurricular activities where you know you are the you know, team lead. So do find out points where you can showcase your leadership skills. This is especially important if you are targeting the, the smaller Ivy League, Ivy League colleges. So in the Ivy League colleges, there are some universities which are huge, like your University of Pennsylvania, Columbia, Cornell. They take thousands of students. So they are huge. But in some universities, such as your Yale or Brown or Dartmouth, so they, are, they take just about less than 1,000 students every year. So they are even more selective. They, are, they give a lot of weightage to leadership and social impact. So depending on which college you are targeting, even within the Ivy League colleges, depending on which college you are targeting, you have to focus on that activity. Now, now social impact, this is a point which is uh, very weak in Indian students' applications. What that means is that if you have a good social impact, that pro profile, which can be social impact projects, physical volunteering experience, if you have that good, you know, then that will definitely help you stand out among the other applicants. Getting admission just means defeating the rest of the applicant profile, right? It uh, getting admission just means you know beating the, your competition. So if you like, if you like uh, reverse it, it means if you want to beat your competition, do things which will help you stand out. So social impact is one such thing. So uh, so in in short, if you ask me that uh, I am very very busy, I can do only you know one or two or three things. You know what should I do? So my recommendation would be make sure that your school grades do not go down, number one. Number two, you no, know, make sure that you have something to demonstrate to the university that why you are interested in the program that you're applying for. And number three is social impact. So if you have limited time, if we have to pick and choose which of these five points to work on, then I would recommend these three points. All right, so um, at this point, I would uh, I would like to pause and um, I'd like to give you guys an assignment, right? So write down, you know, so based on now these five things, so universities will assess your profile based on these five things. So write down one point, you know, where you think you need to now improve, right? Can you write that down, everybody? And put it in the chat. Your messages are coming to me anyway. So assignment is self-evaluate your profile and pick one of these points where where you think you need to now improve. Okay, thanks. Thanks for being so uh, participating so much. So a lot of you have said depth of course interest. So that is that is easy to do. Once you know what you want to do, then there are a lot of ways. You know, the first one good place to start off is by taking relevant online courses on Coursera and edX. Not Udemy or LinkedIn or anything. Those are not offered by universities. So uh, Coursera and edX are the platforms where universities offer courses. So you can you can start off with this. As I say, that's a good place to start off with. And then you can, of course, uh, you know, next steps, depending on how much time you have, then we can guide you on that. Some of you have said social impact. So within social impact, uh, the maximum weightage is given to physical volunteering. So physical, so if you want to, um, if you have the option of, doing something online versus doing something physically, you know, then go and physically volunteer. And even if it is just one or two hours a month, that is enough. 
get associated with a nearby an NGO that is near you, or we can help you, you know, look for, we, I mean, we work with a lot of agencies, etc. We can set you up, right? So there you go and volunteer for one or two hours a month, click pictures, take videos, put it up on the on the on your on your Instagram channel or on your you know uh, YouTube channel or your blog. So whatever you are doing, remember you have to now think how can I show it to the admissions committee, right? Uh, then some of you have said uh, leadership, all right? So leadership again, easiest way to do is if you can get something, some position of responsibility from your school, then you will the letter of recommendation that you will get from your school will come with that. So that is the easiest way. In case that is not there, there are some external leadership programs also. So if you like, we can help you. you know, we, as I said, we work with a lot of separate agencies where we have we have programs, we have activities to build students' profiles up. One of you have said grades. Now, see, that is one thing nobody can help you with. Only you can help. So if you have identified that your school grades, that's the weak point, then just, well, well, you know, start studying, right? And even then, you feel that my uh, grades of the past, that means my 10th grades or uh, my 11th grades are not good. You cannot change the past, right? What you can now think about is that how can I make up for it? So if your school grades are below, let's say, 60%, you know, below 70%, then I would recommend that you should target U.S. universities and get a good score in the on the SAT. Which, which like, if your academic grades are not good, then you will not be getting admission in the in the top universities in in Canada, UK, Ireland, etc. These universities they don't need a city. That means the primary focus is going to be on your grades. So if your school grades are below seventy percent, you will get admission into far better universities in the US than in any other country. Okay, so keep that in mind. So we had a student two years ago. She was my student. So she had, um, she she ended up getting a like like sixty two percent or something. So, but so she applied to U UK colleges in UK and uh, Singapore and everything. But of, she did not get admission. However, she got admission into UC Santa Cruz, University of California, Santa Cruz. Currently, she is in our second year and she's doing really well for computer science. Okay, so if your academics are below seventy percent, you will get admission into far better universities in the US than in any other country. Okay, so keep that point in mind while shortlisting universities. Uh, next point, now SAT requirement. Some of you have taken the SAT exam, so you, and some of you are planning to take the SAT exam. So you should know the requirement, right? Where is SAT required, where, where you, it is not required. If you are applying to a university where SAT is not required, then what you should be doing, etc. So when you look for the SAT you know, policy uh, of different universities, SAT is primarily a U.S. thing. You know? So, I mean, SAT is not required outside in outside the U.S. So even within the U.S. universities, if you go to the website, you will see these languages that we are test mandatory or we are test blind, uh, we are test optional. So you will see these three words, see these three phrases. And they have different implications, you know, as far as you guys go, as far as an applicant goes, these three statements have totally different implications. So let me, let, let me like break it down. And this is when it comes to this, this point, if you get this point, this is what I mean by how important is the SAT score, right? Test mandatory means SAT is mandatory. You have to submit you have the SAT score. And it is going to be one of the important, you know, uh, assessment criteria. So it is, so this is straightforward. So uh, of the top universities, so uh, Georgia Tech is the university which you know, which requires SAT. So if your SAT score is less than 1480, uh, then, uh, you know, there's not a very high chance of you getting admission into Georgia Tech. You know, let's put it like that. Indian students score really, really high on the SAT exam. So therefore, if your score is less than 1480, then it becomes getting admission to a college like Georgia Tech becomes, you know, very difficult. A lot of the universities ranked below 50. For them also, SAT is mandatory. Uh, having said that, you know, because they are not so highly ranked, then you can, even with a score of you know 1250 plus, you should be able to get into a decent college. And if you have uh, SAT scores of 4, 1450 or more, then in the universities ranked below 50, you have a very good chance of now getting scholarship. 
Or different students have different requirements. So this year I'm working with 24 students who are applying for like the next session. Right? So I have students who their primary goal is to get scholarships, as much scholarships as possible. So even if they are, even if they have like high SAT scores, high SAT scores means 1350 plus, 1400 plus, still they want to apply to colleges. Their primary focus is to apply to universities where they can maximize their chances of scholarship so they are choosing to apply to slightly you know lower end colleges because they may end up getting 100 percent scholarship so every person's situation is different okay so tip now you know uh, something that you can uh, you can use to think if your profile is not strong and if your marks in classes 10 and 11 are less than 85 percent you should take the sat and get a good score why because it will improve your chances of admission Plus, you know, if your marks are less than 85%, then your uh, you cannot bet on the fact that that you will get a good SAT score and then you will get you know admission. Therefore, if your if your uh, profile is not as strong as you would like it to be, then do take the SAT and try to get a good score. And if you want to take screenshots, feel free to do so. This part of the information is um, a little complicated, so you may want to revise it later on. So please take screenshots if you want to. Okay. Then comes test blind. The test blind means even if you have an SAT score, universities are not going to look at it. In fact, you can't even submit your SAT score. So your universities outside the US fall in this category. So they do not need SAT scores. You can't even submit your SAT scores. Even if you get 1600 of, out of 1600, you are not going to get any benefit. That is the meaning of test blind. In the US, University of California system, right? So they are they are test blind. So your UC Berkeley, UCLA, no, UC San Diego, there are nine universities in the University of California system and they are test blind. So even if you get, I repeat, even if you have a 1600 out of 1600, you are not going to get any benefit applying to these universities. Now, what this means is that, let's say that you are a very, you have got great academics, you know, great profile. For some reason, you have messed up your SAT. Now, it happens, you know, for some reason, you have messed up your SAT. Uh, then you can apply to these top UC colleges. You can still get into a very good, you know, top university uh, because they are not going to look at SAT anyway, right? So, this is a call that then you can take. So you should apply to test blind schools only if your profile and academics are strong. And and like uh, uh, right now, for example, the deadlines are coming up in January and all, right? So if you do not have the time to retake the SAT, if you are not entirely happy with your SAT score, but if your academics and your profile are strong, then you can apply to the test blind universities. Okay. Everybody clear about the difference between test mandatory and test blind? If, you, if yes, then can you give a thumbs up? Is everybody clear between the, uh, the difference between test blind and test mandatory? They are like opposites. Test mandatory, you have to take the SAT. Test blind is, even if you get 1600, we are not going to look at it. So they are like polar opposites, exact opposites of each other. Now the next is test optional, which is the middle part now. No, we have got test uh, blind on one hand, test uh, like you know, mandatory on one hand, and test optional is in between, right? So that's the whole spectrum now. Now, test optional, what does test optional mean? So test optional means you can apply without the SAT score. But if you have a good score, then you will get advantage. So it is not mandatory for you to submit your SAT score. However, if you have got a good SAT score, you will be given preference. Now, what this means is that, um, what I tell my students is that, take the SAT exam, let's shortlist the universities, and we will send the SAT, or, or you should send the SAT scores only to those universities where you will get advantage. For example, like, you know, uh, last year, one of my students, he had an 1190 on his SAT. So, which is, which is low, right? He want, and his university shortlist was like mix of top and mid school colleges. So, um, so when he applied to a colleges like Purdue or Stanford and all of those, then we did not report the SAT score. He applied based on the strength of his profile. But when he applied to lower colleges, he used the SAT score. 
Then I had another student whose score was 1350, borderline, right? So when she had applied to Michigan, Ann Arbor, and UPenn, so in or uh, those scholars, we did not we did not submit the SAT score because that would have har harmed her profile. A 1350 or uh, in a Michigan, Ann Arbor, you know, would like or UPenn would harm the student's profile. But when she applied to Arizona State, uh, Illinois, Chicago, so there we we like in Michigan State, um, there we submitted the SAT score and she got admission as well as in you know, a scholarships. So it's a very, very um, uh, thin line, you know, your SAT score, once you get the SAT score, do not let that, uh, do not let that dictate your, you know, university shortlist. Apply to the colleges that you want to apply to, but then decide where you will be reporting the SAT score and where you will not be reporting the SAT score. If submitting the SAT score is going to harm your chances of admission, then do not report your SAT score. If submitting the SAT score is going to help you get admission, then report your SAT score. Simple enough, straightforward. So that's the advantage you have with test optional. It's up to you. You can decide. You, you are not under any pressure, so to say. Of course, you should always try to get as high an SAT score as possible, but it does not make sense to give it three, four times. You give it once, you give it second time, and that should be it, right? Not more than twice. Focus your energy on the rest of the things we discussed. You know, we discussed the five parameters, right? So SAT is just one of those components. Instead of spending a lot of time, energy, and money, you know, on the SAT, retaking it multiple times, take it twice, then move on. Move on to the other things in your profile. So in the absence of the SAT scores, right? So if you are applying, you know, so in the, if if you are deciding to apply to test optional colleges, you know, so in the absence of the SAT scores, the other parameters become more important. SAT is one of the admissions criteria, yes, but if you are not submitting it, then the rest of the things should be strong. Your essay should, should be very, very strong. So this year also, we uh, we are working with a, like, a, a student, you know, who he started his whole this study abroad journey very late. Uh, he was uh, studying with uh, Ellen for IITJ, and then he realized that he did, did not want to do that. So uh, that he like uh, beginning of his class 12 year, you know, he's, he changed his path. So he moved, wanted to st do study abroad. So he didn't have too much time. Okay. So, um, so that's why, you know, so your, so for, in his case, he did not have time to prepare or the SAT. So finally we advise him that forget SAT, let's work on the rest of your profile. He had been studying in Ellen since his class nine. So nine, 10, 11, he has zero extracurricular activities. He had like nothing. So he felt that, you know, even without his, uh, even if he had an, had a good SAT score, his profile, the rest of the profile is so weak that he would not have gotten admission. So we advise him to just forget SAT. Let's work on the rest of the profile, right? So, so those are also decisions that you can take if you are thinking of applying to test optional colleges. So here the tip is, if your profile and academics are very strong, but your SAT score is low, then do not report your SAT score, as I told you. If your profile in academics are average, but your SAT score is high, then report your SAT score. Okay, so uh, SAT in the test optional universities, it's your choice to report the SAT, you know, depending on how it will improve, how it will impact your chances of admission. So this, the test optional universities, it's a little tricky. Is everybody clear with that? So somebody is asking, if we do not report, then also they can pull SAT scores. No, if you do not report to universities, they can they will not have access to your SAT scores. In fact, to, if you want to send your SAT score to any university, you have to pay for that. And, I mean, you get to send your scores to four universities for free, yes. But after that, if you want to report your score to any universities, you are, you have, you are going to pay for that. So it's not available. It's not out there, right? So universities cannot access your SAT score unless you choose to send the score to them. Aditya, I hope that is clear. So Ryan is asking, uh, do we get scholarship in these colleges? So yes, if you are applying to a college without SAT, you know, and uh, they are considering you for admission, they will also consider you for if a scholarship, right? Uh, Ritik, you are asking, is SAT accepted in all universities across the world? So the uh, uh, when you say accepted, see, it's, it's not. So for example, you cannot submit your SAT score to uh, universities outside the US, right? In India, if you want to apply to India, then some of the Indian universities, such as 
Ashoka, Plaksha, Kriya, you know, they will, or uh, Narsimonji, they also accept the SAT score, yes. You know, uh, but uh, it's, it's like US and, and India, that's about it. So Manish Rathi, you were asking, when you apply to colleges, you will not have 12th grade marks. Does 12th grade marks matter later on? Yes, very good question. And the answer is yes. So um, I, I told you that you will need to submit predicted grades. So your school would be submitting something called predicted grades. So they would say that we predict that, um, uh, like what was, we predict,